So for those of you already here, welcome. Glad to see you. Hey, hi, Joe. I'm honored that you're here. I'm sorry you can't respond right now, but we'll unmute the microphones later at the end for uh, questions and discussion. So, and we've still got, according to my computer, six minutes till the top of the hour, and then we'll give it about one additional minute for people to roll in, and then we'll get started. But glad to see you already here. So for everyone already here, welcome. We still have three minutes to the top of the hour. And then we'll give it another minute. So or so. So for those of you already here, welcome. We're going to get started in another about three minutes. Hope you're having a great day. Unfortunately, it's not a pretty day here in Texas. You probably can't see well outside my window behind me, but it's raining and there's actually a flood watch. Thunderstorms. Oh, let's see. Well, you're welcome, Joe, and thanks for your kind remarks. So again, welcome for everybody that's already here. Uh, we'll unmute mics later, so at the end, uh, you'll be able to to talk and 
if you have questions or if, if there's a discussion. I see it's now the top of the hour. And we'll give it about one more minute and then we'll get going. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. So welcome everybody. Glad that you could join us today. Uh, I'm Mike Riddle and today's webinar is OPGW Lightning Theory in Practice. I promise you this is going to be the best webinar on OPGW that you will see today. So let's get going. <laughs> I hope we get going. Oh, there we go. Okay, so this is a RCEP compliant webinar. This means that we've met their standards and we can give you continuing education credits. At the end, I will tell you how you can actually get those credits. So, but, uh, but it means we've met their standards. It doesn't mean that they endorse any of our content or improve of it or whatever. So today we're gonna talk about lightning and here are like an overview of the course. Uh, and here are the specific learning objectives. So uh, I want you to understand that lightning is the second leading cause of OPGW failure. We'll see what number one is in a minute. I want you to understand the four components of a lightning strike. I want you to understand what Quranic level is. We'll also talk about lightning class levels give you an idea of how to assess the level of lightning protection that your system might need. I uh, want you to understand the industry standards as they pertain to lightning protection and lightning testing. And we'll close out with some discussion about uh, how to repair lightning damage or thoughts about how to replace cable if you can't repair it. So here's the agenda. Uh, you've just had the introduction and course description and learning objectives. So in a minute, we'll hit the presentation. It should take about an hour, uh, hopefully a little less, because I want to leave time for uh, questions and answers. Uh, please keep questions today uh, related to the topic. And as I mentioned earlier, what we'll do is for now, your mics are muted just because it works better that way. And then at the end, we'll unmute it. Or if that doesn't work, because sometimes we've had trouble with that, if that does not work, uh, you can just type questions into chat. So let's get going. So first, just want to remind you that OPGW protects against lightning as well as provides a telecommunications capability. Uh, so the primary function of OPGW was to act like a traditional shield wire or ground wire, and a traditional cable had two functions, to protect the phase conductors from lightning 
and to provide a path for fault current. So today we're just going to talk about the lightning aspect, a separate webinar on the fault current aspect. So I also want to remind you that there are three basic types of OPGW. There's center tube type, aluminum pipe type, and stranded stainless steel loose tube type. The types don't really matter too much for most of what we're going to talk about today, but I will tie in this concept of a rough qualitative assessment of the performance of the different design types at the very end. So, you know, why talk about lightning performance? Well, because, as I mentioned already, it's the number two source of damage or failure in the field for OPGW. Um, number one is installation. Actually, we have a separate webinar on that too. So lightning is number two, but as I say here, it tries harder, awfully hard to damage your cable. So we human beings, so I mentioned uh, we're having thunderstorms today, and as I was driving in, I was watching the lightning flashes. You know, we see a single flash, but actually there's more going on there. And what's been determined is that there are four components to a lightning strike. There's a, an initial stroke. It's this big spike, uh, you know, what you're really seeing. Uh, there's then sort of a transitory phase that's called intermediate current. Then you have this continuing current, and then you have a restrike at the end. And we're going to see that it's this continuing current that is what of most concern to us. I just wanted to point out that lightning has four components and that there are four horsemen of the apocalypse. Is this just a coincidence? I'll let you think about that. But now back to our topic. So there are four components. What's really damaging our cable? Well, to understand that, we have to look more closely at the waveform. So here's that waveform again. Note that the time scale is not to scale. It's just a representation. So we have time on the x-axis and current on the y-axis. And again, not to scale. So if we look at these amplitudes, so they're going to be related to the intensity of a strike. We'll see peak amplitude of this initial strike is 200 kA. Wow, that's a lot. You would think that that would do some serious damage to your cable. Then you look at this intermediate current. It's on the order of 2 kA, still significant. Not as bad as this, but significant. And then the continuing current, um, amplitude 200 to 800 amps. I mean, that doesn't sound so bad. Why are, why are we going to end up worried about this? Uh, and then the restrike, no surprise, about half of the initial strike. So again, 100K. So again, you know, at first glance, you would think that this or this or maybe even this, that they're, they're what's doing the damage. But what I said on the previous slide is this is the one that you end up worrying about. Well, to understand that, you also have to pay attention to the durations of the, the component. So the initial strike, the duration is on the order of microseconds. This transitory phase or the continuing intermediate current or continue, yeah, intermediate current is on the order of milliseconds. This continuing current is on the order of seconds. And then the restrike again, we're back into the realm of microseconds. So if we integrate across this waveform, which is to say, oops, went the wrong direction there. Okay, sorry. So if we find the area under the curve, and to do that, we're gonna simplify the C and just make it a rectangle. What we're going to find is that the A has 50 amp seconds. We're going to define an amp second as a coulomb, and it's often called a charge transfer. So we end up with 50 coulombs, and you can think of that as the energy content of that component 
or yeah, that component of the strike. That transitory phase, we get 10 coulombs. Our continuing current, we get 300 coulombs, about. All of these numbers are uh, approximate. So that's on the order, surprisingly, of 10 times what it was for that initial, uh, the initial strike component. And then the restrike, 24 coulombs, about half of the A. So it turns out this is what's doing the damage, and this is why. Its energy content is much greater than the other components of the strike. So a little more background here. Coronic level sometimes is spelled differently, but it's the average number of days per year with lightning detected. A uh, hundred years ago, they were doing that by listening for thunder, uh, then upgraded to electronic detection using the, the um, a strike generates an electromagnetic field. And so that's going to disrupt some certain radio frequencies. So you could detect lightning that way. Now we use satellite uh, detection to get the number of lightning strikes. Now, what's more common, and you see it at the top of the slide, is isochronic. So that iso just means that we're leveling the content within an area. So we're trying to find where the number of strikes is about the same. So if you look at this worldwide isochronic level map, uh, so this shade of orange means everything in this area has 20 to 39 strikes per year on average. So that's all. So where can you get this data? Well, if you go to this website, Vaisala, excuse me for a moment, <laughs> you can get data, but for a fee. Well, I thought at least for the United States, I would be able to get data from the National Weather Service, which is connected to the to NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And I went to those sites, but they take you to Vaisala, which again, doesn't provide it for free. So I figured there must be big money in lightning data. Uh, but there are other sources on the internet. You can basically get some basic information about isochronic levels. So the problem is that isochronic levels correlate with the likelihood of lightning damage, but a correlation is not a causation, number one. And number two, it's not 100%, which means, so it's not a correlation factor of one, one to one. So it's not 100% predictive. Um, a bigger problem that we're going to see later is, well, actually, we've already seen it. What's doing the damage? The damage is the continuing current. Why? Well, because its energy content is the greatest. Well, energy content means that you need to know about the intensity and you need to know the duration, exactly what we calculated a moment ago. And you get none of that from an isochronic map. So you don't know the energy of the strikes. You just know, I have a lot of lightning here, not so much there. Uh, so as I say here, you have to use these maps gently. I'll give you some very approximate guidelines later. So we've, we've done some background, and I'm, I try to make these webinars useful. So the key question of this specific webinar is, how should a transmission line engineer incorporate lightning performance into their line design? So I'm going to propose a framework for doing that. It's a four-step framework. Again, the four. So here are the steps. Use the resources available to you wisely. Decide what you're going to do. Observe your field performance and then iterate as appropriate. So we'll talk about each of these. So what are the resources that are available to you as a transmission line engineer? Well, first, there's your utilities experience. Secondly, what you can find in studies. Third, the standards for OPGW and specifically the laboratory lightning tests that are included in the two most used standards in the world today. 
And four, talk to your cable manufacturers. Let's talk about each. First up, direct experience. Two, two aspects of that. First is, has your utility already been using a conventional ground wire? And I'm sure the answer to that in like 99.9% .9 of the cases is yes. So what have you been using and what's been the track record of those cables? So specifically, have you had lightning damage problems? You know, if so, how bad? Was it just uh, some broken wires that could be repaired or was it complete cable failure? Obviously, you'll need to do more if you've had bigger problems. Likewise, what's been the frequency? Is it often? And that, that's a very relative term. You know, what I think is often, you might think is not so often, but that's the best I can do in, in this context is, would you characterize it as often or is it just something that's very occasional? If it's occasional, you can make a case, especially economically speaking, that you don't need to do much. But if it's an ongoing significant problem to you, if it's creating you headaches, well then yeah, do something. And we'll talk about the things that you can do later. So many utilities have already used OPGW. I mean, it's been around for over 30 years at this point. So if you've used OPGW, again, what's your experience been? Have you already had incidents of lightning damage? Again, how bad? just a few broken wires that could be repaired or complete cable failure. And again, this concept of how frequent is it just, has it been often or just a very occasional problem for you? So based upon that direct experience, you should be formulating lessons learned. So if you've experienced big problems, then you need to face that truth and change something. Uh, ideas on what to change later, but you know the old saying to continue doing the same thing and expect a different outcome is the definition of insanity, and that is true here as well. If you're having problems and you choose to just change nothing, then you're going to continue to have problems. So, um, if your utility has collected data on the frequency or intent or intensity of lightning. It, and or duration as well, I should have added here. Well, wow, that's great data and you should absolutely take advantage of that. And I'll kind of point you where you could later. So first re resource that you have is your own experience or your, your utilities experience, I should say. Next up was the studies. And ideally, we could find published studies that document the severity of lightning by geographical error. It would give you that duration and intensity information that I mentioned earlier. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to exist. If it does, I can't find it. Um, I do find studies that, but they don't have information that I consider actionable. So some published data suggests that negative polarity occurs more frequently in the field and can be more damaging. Okay, that's interesting, but is it really useful? You know, I told you, I drove in this morning, I saw some lightning strikes. I, were they negative polarity, positive polarity? I don't know, <laughs> how would I know? Uh, and, by, and then, by the way, other data suggests there's no significant difference. So you get the direct opposite. So. Unfortunately, the studies at this point don't seem to provide much help. So we can hope for the future, but right now uh, you don't get much from them, at least from my experience. Okay, so next up, third resource is the standards. What can you get from the standards? And recall there are two. Uh, I want to give you some more background here. Uh, so you see the evolution of the standards. So in the early 90s, um, or the 90s in general, it was still the early days of OPGW. You know, some OPGW, I think, started late 80s, but really in the 90s is when it really gets going. And the standards did not include anything about lightning until the IEC added something in 1999. So, you know, almost 10 years during the early heydays before the first thing gets put into a standard. 
The 1994 edition of IEEE had no, no lightning tests. So there was really, you know, it was a reference that, yeah, it's supposed to protect against lightning, but no specific uh, requirements for the cables to meet in order to do that. So despite that, some manufacturers and utilities were doing what they called lightning tests, but they were always impulse tests. So they were roughly equivalent to the component A. Basically, you would do like uh, 50 kA or 100 kA for uh, like five milliseconds or something like that. I, I, I don't remember exactly, but again, they were roughly equivalent to component A, which meant the energy level was much lower. And as a consequence of that, few cables failed. Uh, you know, that type of test just wasn't going to do significant damage because the energy content was relatively low. And on top of that, the pass fail criteria was very subjective. So at least I'm not aware of any cables that failed those early lightning tests. But there was a recognition that something standardized and better was needed. So the IEC, uh, both standards have continued to evolve over the years. Um, this pictorial represents the evolution of the IEC standard. We don't need to go into the details of that. I just want to look at the key provisions as related to lightning testing that are in the current version of the standard. Those key uh, provisions are five simulated strikes with positive polarity. A con they focus on the continuing current component only, so you're only trying to simulate waveform component C. The pass-fail criteria is based upon calculating the cable's remaining strength, excluding any broken wires. So if you had a cable with 12 wires, two of them broke, you would calculate the remaining strength based upon 10 wires. And that remaining strength needs to be above 75% of the original rated breaking strength of the cable. Now, how accurate is that? Because we'll see in a minute, wires can be burned or damaged or possibly annealed. If it's annealed, you may not see any sign of damage. So it could be that, the, uh, that your calculation is off. So and we'll get some insight into that later. Likewise, the IEEE 1138 standard evolved over the years, and it was most recently revived in 2021. So let's look at the key provisions in that standard. Again, five hits, but this time with negative polarity. Remember, some of the studies said that negative polarity would be more damaging. Again, focusing on the continuing current component, so that waveform component C, and its pass-fail criteria is based on testing the cable's remaining strength. In the 2009 version, I want to point out that like the IEC standard, the pass-fail criteria was based on the remaining strength being above 75% rated breaking strength. And in the case of the IEEE, I know the reasoning was that the US NESC 250B loading allows a cable to do 60% rated breaking strength under fully loaded conditions. And then they added 15% as a margin for error. However, there was an unintended consequence of that. The smaller center tube type designs, remember at the beginning we talked about design types, those cables tend to fail uh, because they often came in under this. So in the 2021 edition, this criteria was changed to the remaining strength must be greater than the cable's maximum rated design tension, MRDT. The reasoning was in the field, in theory, the cable should not exceed MRDT during operation. So, that's true, strictly speaking. However, your design conditions are just that, a, a, a designed scenario. It's an assumption about wind and ice loading conditions. Mother nature often does not respect the assumptions that human beings make. So you can design a cable for half an inch of ice and four pound wind or whatever, 
and Mother Nature can give you one inch of ice and a eight pound wind or whatever. So this does mean that smaller center tube type designs now pass the test because typically their MRDT is going to be in the range of 40 to 60% rate of breaking strength. So they can pass. But you as a user need to think about how much remaining strength you really need. We'll come back to that again later. So both standards are based on lightning class levels, and they fortunately use the same lightning class levels. A class level is intended to be a standardized severity level based upon the charge transfer in, expressed in coulombs. And this allows you to compare and contrast test results. So you can compare different cable designs, design A versus design B. You can compare different design types, center tube versus aluminum pipe versus a stranded stainless steel loose tubes. And you can even compare different manufacturers. Although comparing manufacturer A to manufacturer B is more likely to be a function of the design differences between you know, manufacturer A's design A versus manufacturer B's design B. Although if two designs are very similar, it is possible that perhaps optical performance differences could show up. Uh, in other webinars, we've talked about zero fiber strain margin something like you know a significant difference between the zero fiber strain margin of design a versus design b might show up you might be able to see that uh, the other thing the standardized severity levels allow you to do is to verify your design so if you have selected a lightning class level that you believe your system must have a test allows you to verify that the cable meets that lightning class level. What are those lightning class levels? Well, for whatever reason, they go 0, 1, 2, and 3. So there are four of them. Again, another four. Um, why they didn't go 1, 2, 3, 4, I don't know. This is what they did. So class 0, uh, you have your current and you have time. Note that the time is always the same. You're just varying the current. You can then calculate the charge transfer in Coulomb. So 50, 100, 150, and 200. So what class should you use? Well, hold that thought. I just want to make a passing reference to the uh, lab setup. Um, your cable is under some tension. You have a electrode, and you probably can't see it well, but there's a tiny fuse wire between the electrode and the cable, and that's going to allow the arc to get started. It immediately burns away, and then you're just left with the arc from the simulated strike. But just remember, this arc is or the the gap here is on the order of uh, about half inch, I think, inch maybe, half inch to an inch. Uh, keep that in mind for later, you know, uh, and then for centimeters, so on the order of one to two centimeters ish. Keep that in mind for later. So after you've done the simulated strikes, uh, you have to determine the remaining strength of the cable. You either do that if you're testing per IEEE by the calculated method based upon the unbroken wires. In the IEEE standard, you take the cable and you go to a tensile testing machine like this, and you uh, pull the cable till it breaks. No surprise, the cable typically breaks at the location of the simulated uh, lightning strike because you know you had damaged wires there. So as I keep mentioning, the IC standard, you calculate the remaining strength based upon the remaining unbroken wires. You ignore anything that's just a little bit damaged. They have to be burned completely through. And so consequently, those are not factoring into that calculation. We'll see the effect of that in a minute. In the IEEE standard, you're actually measuring the remaining strength. So if wires are just burned or damaged, 
you're going to see the effect of that in the, the results. So here's an example. So here was a center tube type cable with a single outer layer of eight aluminum clad steel wires. In the test strike, zero wires were broken, but three were burned or damaged. You can see this wire has been damaged. This wire has been damaged and note that it's damaged in two spots. That's interesting. That tells you the arc was moving around. This wire is damaged again in two spots, just a little bit of a spot here. Now, when I look at the photograph, I actually think that there's a fourth wire um, that's been damaged too, but officially it was reported as three wires were burned. So using the calculated methodology, you've got no broken wires, you've got eight unbroken wires, so the calculated remaining strength is 100%. So per the IEC standard, that's greater than 75% rated breaking strength or rated tensile strength as it's given here. That's a pass. Yay. <laughs> Under the measured criteria, you've got no broken wires, you've got those three burned wires, you actually go and tensile test the cable and it failed at 70% rated breaking strength. So per the 2009 criteria, that's less than 75% rated breaking strength and that's a fail. Per the, two, the 2021 criteria, you don't know because you'd also have to know the MRDT of the cable. And by the way, I wanted to thank Connectrix for uh, some of these illustrations and the, the data here for this specific example. Lightning class level, just to, to sort of make the point, makes a difference. Here's one cable that's been tested at class one. That's 100 coulombs. You can see the damage here. It's, it's significant. The wire has started to melt. Remaining strength, 79%. Uh, RTS, not bad. Take that same cable and go test it to class three, which is uh, 200 coulombs. The damage is very severe. Wires just obliterate it. Um, remaining strength, 54% rated breaking strength. So you've seen the difference that your pass fail criteria makes. It's important and you should be aware of that and factor that in your assessment of the results that you get from this type of testing. Now, the thought may occur to you, isn't it obvious that the measured criteria is better? And it's definitely more accurate, but there are trade-offs. Um, this test is already expensive. It's about 25 grand. And if you add a follow-on test, that, that tensile test, it's a lot cheaper, but it's still gonna add a couple three grand to it. Um, so you're adding further expense to a test that's already expensive. There's also a practical problem that some labs can do electrical tests, but not mechanical ones. So then you put yourself in the situation, maybe you have to work with more than one lab and that just complicates things. It's doable, but it complicates things. You may also wonder, well, what about that calculated criteria? What if we just go went out and treated the burned, damaged wires, you know, if it's significant, but of course that's a very subjective term, but what if you just treat them as if they're broken? And my response to that is you would just get a third answer that muddies the water. So in that specific case, you would find 63% remaining breaking strength, assuming you neglected the tube. Okay, now what? Okay, if if you did that, you fail the 2009 version of IEEE 1138, but you might pass the 2021 edition. I just don't see that you've gotten significant information that you can use, that, that's useful to you uh, if, if you were to, to do that. So I do prefer the measured uh, criterion. I, I, I definitely think it's better, but you should understand it does add some time and cost to, to get another test done. So, bottom line, what can the standards do for you? So again, I've got a four-step framework. One, 
select a lightning class level, two, perform the lightning test, three, assess the results. There's an immediate assessment and then a longer term assessment. We'll talk about it. And then four, back to iterate as appropriate. So let's talk about them. Um, number one, select a lightning class level. There's no specific way to do this. That is, unless you have intensity and duration data. Remember I said way back at the beginning, if your utility has collected data about lightning, this is the time to use it because that data, if it includes intensity and duration, you can directly calculate the, uh, the amount of energy and strikes, and you can then use that to uh, determine an appropriate class level for you. If you don't have that, you're kind of basically guessing. I mean, I hate to say it that way, but that's what it is. Isochronic data helps you put it in the ballpark. That's the best it can do. Remember, it doesn't give you information about intensity or duration. It just says there's more lightning strikes in this area versus that area. But that's still useful to you in a very general sense because obviously the odds are if you have more strikes in an area, you're more likely to have uh, at least one of them have a high enough intensity and duration to do some damage. But uh, again, I, I have to say it's very arbitrary. It's a lot of guesswork. So my example, I took this isochronic map for the US because it had this nice legend here that gives you the color codes for the pretty colors. And there's eight of them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And there's four lightning class levels. So I can group these two and I can group these two and I can group these two and I can group these two. And that's very, very nice and convenient and pretty, but it's also totally arbitrary. I mean, being, being brutally honest with you here, totally arbitrary. So class zero, I grouped these low, these two down here. Class one, I grouped these two. Class three, I grouped these two. Class three, I grouped these two. So I think I started saying class one, two, three, but I, it should have been class zero, but you get the idea. You can see it here. So very arbitrary, very subjective. Again, it, it's the best I can come up with. You can mix it with your own utilities experience. If you've had damage, you know, you could use this map. You've had damage, you could say, okay, let's bump it up one. You've not had damage, eh, bump it down one. It's a, it's a guideline, best we can do. So once you've selected a class, however you did it, you could, I, I forgot to mention, you could throw a dart, uh, put, put zero, put, write uh, zero, one, two, three, four on four slips of paper, put them in a hat and draw a class level out, you know, whatever you do. But wh however you come up with your class level, next step would be do the testing. Third step is assess the results. Did the cable pass? You know, that's your basic starting point. Did it pass the test or not? But even if yes, you need to take a look at it because the central question for you as a transmission line designer is, is that remaining strength adequate? First of all, what if a cable's MRDT is less than 60% rated breaking strength? There is nothing inherently bad about that, but you should think about it in context of your uh, utilities loading criteria and its design philosophy because the traditional NESC 250B rules allows the cable to go up to 60% rated breaking strength. So if the MRD, if the remaining strength is 50%, that's going to tell you that under your design conditions, you could exceed the cable's remaining strength and the cable could fail mechanically. What are the odds of that? I don't know, probably low but they're not zero. So how much risk are you or your utility willing to take? It's a design philosophy question at that point. Now, that's just based upon the traditional loading criteria. And by the way, for those 
that are outside of the United States, the same concept applies. Whatever your country or your utilities design criteria are, if the remaining strength is less than what you allow in design, you do have a non-zero chance of, I'll call it catastrophic mechanical failure, you know, to underscore the point. Mechanical failure means the cable breaks and falls down. That's not a good thing, and we all know that. So uh, next up, your utility might go beyond that. In the NESC 250 C and D extreme ice and concurrent wind and ice loaded conditions, it allows the cable to go to 80% rated breaking strength. And if you're doing that in your design calculations, you might think that a cable with, that would pass the standard at 75%, you could make an argument that you need the cable to be have more remaining strength, specifically 80% or more uh, rated breaking strength. That's, you're the user, you, you determine that. Uh, you can give some context to the results. Um, my observation is that lab damage seems to be more severe than actual damage I've seen from the field. Uh, you know, I've seen cables that come back. The problem is you get cables that come back from the field and you have no idea what the, uh, how much energy the strike had. What was the duration? What was the, um, uh, uh, the, the current. Um, so, you, you know, did it have 50 coulombs that hit it or was it 100 or whatever? You have no idea. You, you can only, again, make kind of a qualitative assessment. Um, you know, it would be great if we started collecting more data. However, you can do monitor field performance. So, um, if you've selected a level and you're still having problems, then you should adjust your specification. Something needs to change. You, you either need to change the, the specifications, maybe require a higher class level or a higher remaining strength, or you've got to change your expectations, right? You know, which is to say you make a conscious decision to just live with the problems, um, but something ought to, ought to change one or the other. I do have to warn you, though, that if you change your requirements, like make the uh, use a higher class level or you change uh, the remaining strength, you want to require 80 percent, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there are trade offs there, because if you're uh, doing things that increase a cable's diameter, weight or and cost, well, there are those consequences. You'll you'll have those trade offs. Uh, come in conjunction with your change. So that's re we wrapped up what you can glean, how you can get help from the standards. So now let's talk about the cable manufacturers. All cable manufacturers have had strikes on their cable, real or laboratory. Everybody's had damage to their cable, again, real and or laboratory. So what have they learned? You can talk to all of them and ask what their lessons are, and you should filter and compare, and you should challenge when it seems appropriate, right? Some cable manufacturer, oh, we've never had lightning damage in the field in our cable. I would challenge that claim, just saying. Uh, for today, I can only speak to my experience and NCAB's experience here, but I am going to share that with you. Um, my experience, uh, I totaled it up. I used to say 25 years. It's actually gone over 30 years. It makes me feel old to say that. But um, And my experience with NCAB, NCAB uh, is not 30 years, but my experience working at a utility, working at another cable manufacturer, actually two other cable manufacturers and an, an, and an NCAB, I'm going to share what I've learned. Uh, number one is general guideline. Number one that I would give you based upon my experience is that uh, if you've designed well for fault current, you get good lightning performance as well. It's a free bonus. Now, I talk about that in a separate presentation uh, about fault current and, and how to design well for that. So that's 
uh, my general guideline number one. General guideline number two is that there aren't any, right? Nobody uh, beyond this, nobody agrees. In fact, I'm not even sure that everybody would agree with my general guideline number one, uh, but it's still my guideline and by God, I agree with it. So, uh, but guideline number two, there's no, no general agreement on how to design for lightning, but I can share some observations with you. Again, sharing my experience. Observation number one, size matters. So all else being equal, a larger wire is less likely to be burned through than a smaller one. No surprise, right? As a consequence of that, I have seen utilities adopt minimum wire sizes. I often see 2.9 to 3 millimeters. Those values are picked completely arbitrarily. There is no data that substantiates 2.9 or 3 millimeters. Not nice, uh, in the case of 3 millimeters, a nice, very round number. Um, and in the range of wire sizes that are commonly used in OPGW today, but completely arbitrary. Now, in contrast, I have seen utilities draw upon their field experience. One in particular, they used a lot of seven number eight you know, conventional shield wire for decades. And they said, we haven't had a lot of design uh, lightning problems. So let's make our minimum wire size number eight, uh, which that's uh, the, the size works out to 3.26 millimeters in diameter. Uh, I respect that approach. I'm not saying I agree with it, but I do respect it. So they require the outer wires on their OPGW to be 3.26 millimeters or greater. They don't have a lot of problems with lightning damage in the field, at, at least in terms of it causing catastrophic problems. So do I think that's necessary? Would, you know, would I recommend that to every utility in the country? Well, no, but as I say, I respect uh, the process that they went through to make that determination. So, uh, Overall cable diameter seems to be a factor as well. I'm guessing that that's because it spreads the strike energy out over a larger area. And we've actually seen that in testing. We had a, one of our uh, aluminum pipe type cables with a larger ID relative to a smaller center tube type cable, but it had larger outer wires. And this cable actually did better than this cable. So that contradicts observation uh, 1A. So it's more complicated. Consequently, these are just observations, very general guidelines, and you'll, you'll keep hearing me qualify them that way as we continue. So when you do that, you do need to consider the trade-offs because when you increase wire size or cable OD, you're increasing cost, weight, and structural loading. You may also be decreasing maximum real length, which could mean more poles and setups and more splice points, which in turn means more cost. So I just want you to understand there are consequences, which is to say there are trade-offs. Observation number two, material matters as well. ACS does better than aluminum alloy wire in, in general. Um, the number one field reports of damage that are, is non-catastrophic damage, so the cable didn't completely fail, but the number one field report from cable that I've seen is broken aluminum alloy wires. Tends to be kind of a nuisance problem. So, um, some utilities require an all ACS outer layer, but again, you run into those trade-offs with cable weight and cost. And to jump back up here, if, if you do this, well, if you really wanna make your cable super lightning resistance, you could go to galvanized steel. Galvanized steel is not used in OPGW though because the electrical properties are so crappy. So you lose fault current is the specific problem that you have so uh but even this gets contradicted because uh remember the testing results that we just did we just talked about here oops sorry 
here. Well, there was another wrinkle to them. Um, not only did the AP, so the aluminum pipe type cable, had a larger OD with smaller wires, but it had a mixed ACS and AY outer layer. And the smaller cable, they were all ACS wires, and yet the this cable did better. It shouldn't have. And not only did it do better, none of the AY wires were broken in the in the lab test. It was ACS wires that were broken. Why? Beats the heck out of me. Because I, I just attribute it to Mother Nature sometimes likes to, to screw with you a little bit. Because <laughs> you would not predict those results at all. Observation number three, wire count matters. So X number of coulombs is going to burn through Y number of wires. So if Y is in a cable with 12 wires, that's a lower reduction of strength than if that cable has eight wires in it, which is to say a cable with 12 wires would have a greater residual strength than a cable with only eight, all else being equal. And the, these test results that I keep referring to, same situation here. The larger OD, smaller outer wires, greater wire count. Now, why is that? Uh, I suspect that uh, what's happening is the larger OD is allowing the energy to be spread out over a greater area, surface area, than a smaller OD. And I think a higher wire count also plays into that as well, as opposed to all the energy coming into more of more of a focal point, and then you obliterate that wire, and then you get sort of a cascade effect uh, moving on. But whatever, it, it, I've observed that in real life, uh, or in lab testing, I should say. Um, design type is a factor and it's rough guidelines, but I think it's more of a factor because of the previous things we talked about. Center tube type cables, I think, are fine. You know, they're not falling down all over the country. They don't do well in the laboratory tests, but, you know, they're not falling down all over the country. Um, so I think they're, they're fine, they're good. Aluminum pipe type cables do seem to do better, especially in the lab testing. And then the stranded stainless steel tube design, I think, does the best. But again, you do have to factor in trade-offs. There are definitely times when it's appropriate to use a center tube type design because they are mechanically and electrically very efficient, which means for the same mechanical electrical properties, they have small diameters. So in some situations, they're a great I want to say they're bad. I do want to say that it, you know if you're only looking at one performance aspect of your OPGW and specifically you're looking at lightning performance, I do think that the stranded stainless steel loose tube or the aluminum pipe designs do better. Observation number five, low footing resistance correlates with low incidence of lightning damage. So strikes are more likely to hit on or near a structure, if there's, especially if there's good um, uh, footing resistance, lo meaning low footing resistance. So on the structure means the cables not hit. Near the structure means the hits might be on the supporting accessory, the dead ends or suspensions. There's more metal there, uh, therefore more uh, metal to absorb and dissipate the energy. Um, what you're doing is creating conditions that push the odds in your favor, right? More, fewer hits on the cable itself is going to, all else being equal, lead to fewer instances of lightning damage on the cable, especially catastrophic damage. So, in the real world, you could do a great job in specifying your cable. And as I've talked about already, the reality factor says you're still going to have cable damage eventually because that's just the way real life and mother nature roll. 
So what to do? <coughs> First up, the repair option. If it's just a couple broken wires, you might be able to repair it with repair rods. General guidelines, you need 50% remaining strength in the cable. You need to confirm that with the specific accessory supplier. The cable manufacturer should help you be able to help you uh, estimate the remaining strength in the cable, right? You're not going to know that. You're just going to see, oh, there are six wires broken. How much remaining strength is in the cable? Go to the cable manufacturer. Now, the cable manufacturer may want more than this. You know, you've you've again, you've got to work with both the cable manufacturer and the uh, accessory supplier or the repair rod supplier. Basically, they're a specialized version of armor rods. Uh, you won't have to replace the cable, so that's going to save you some money and it's quick, e you know, easy to do if you've got the rods. But you do have to do this estimated strength calculation, and that does imply error. Um, there is a hassle factor, you know, obviously in the middle of a span somewhere, damaged cable may be hard to get to. So there is sort of a hassle factor in getting this done. And you've obviously got to source or stock uh, these repair rods. To replace, you may have to or be forced to replace a section of cable. Now consider the big consideration here is time. Um, you know, if you don't already have the cable on hand, you've got to factor in how to get it. Historically, OPGW took about 10 to 12 weeks to get. Right now, for the last couple of years, it's been significantly longer than that. You do have some workarounds. One is to use ADSS or dielectric cable as a temporary repair. Uh, that can be done potentially with the line still energy energized, and it can be done quickly. Uh, but it does imply extra work, right? You put a temporary repair and then you have to go back and do a permanent repair. There's also some vulnerability of the temporary repair. When we talk about ADSS cables, their number one killer is shotgun damage uh, in the field. And you've got to source or have stock of the cable and the accessories that you need to do that. Workaround number two, uh, which I think is better, is to keep an emergency length of cable on hand, ideally on a steel reel. Uh, wood reels, if stored outside, are not good for more than about six months or so, number one. But even if you store them indoors, you know, it might be years, possibly even decades before you need the cable. And so you can get dry rot and other bad things that happen to the cable or to the reel itself rather. So I do think it's better to get it, uh, require a steel reel. Of course, cable manufacturer is going to charge you for that, but I think it's worth it in the long run. And you need to get the accessories that you need. Um, ideally seal them in a, in a crate. Uh, if you've got this emergency length of cable, then you're able to go out and get the problem repaired quickly. It's a permanent solution and you're not scrambling around trying to get cable and accessories that you need. Uh, so you reduce the overall hassle factor here, but you've got to source and maintain this emergency repair kit. That's going to cost you some money. <laughs> and even if you do it, you've got to be concerned about people uh, pilfering from your sealed crate, which is why it should be sealed. Um, and you've got to do the work, figuring out the quantities. How much cable do you want to get? Do you want to buy a reel of 5,000 feet or a reel of 10,000 feet? Um, I will note that if you're in a repair situation, you can reuse tangents, but you, I strongly recommend do not reuse dead ends. The dead ends should be new. How much should you replace? Well, you could replace just the affected span. So from the clo closest two structures, that adds two splice points, but obviously takes less cable and accessories to put that repair into effect. Um, you could go to the closest splice point that adds just one splice point, but then requires more cable and accessories, or you can replace the entire segment. So you're not adding any splice points but requires a lot more cable and accessories. You know, I think this is kind of overkill, but I make cable, so I'm not going to complain if you choose to do that. And to give you some context on the effect of adding splice points, typical splice loss at 1550 is going to be about 0.01 dB. Um, 
maximum 0.05 dB. So most of the time you're only going to add this. Sometimes occasionally you might add this. You can tolerate certainly this and likely this. Officially, you got to go talk to your network guys, but I, I suspect you can take the extra splice loss. So I want to close out with just one more thing. Uh, lightning can have adverse short-term effects on communications. Um, what's happened is that uh, data rates have gone up and utilities that have crossed into 100 gigabits per second systems have had problems. These systems use what's called coherent transmission techniques and in particular uh, dense wave division multiplexing and it boosts your data rate. So a factor of 10 over what you used to use, you know, 20 years ago or whatever. And it turns out that the strikes do interf interfere with the signal. Um, it's on the order of micro to milliseconds. You get some bit errors. Uh, the cause is still sort of being discussed and uh, studied and debated and whatnot. Um, one thought is that it's a sudden mechanical and thermal shock of, of strikes not every strike, but some strikes um, could be. Uh, the other possibility is electromagnetic field coupling or electromagnetic field interference. I suspect, because I'm an electrical engineer, that that's likely what's really causing the problem. Uh, because light is actually a form of electromagnetic radiation, so is a lightning strike. Um, they're just different points on the spectrum. Uh, no surprise that the fields could couple and therefore interfere with one another, and which lightning doesn't care, but obviously your data transmission would care. What are the solutions? Well, uh, electronic error correcting systems help that they're built into the communications technology itself. They help a lot, but they can get overwhelmed by, by this effect. Uh, there is a thought that wire selection and adjusting the lay length. So in other words, the cable design itself could be changed to make it maybe not uh, completely foolproof against this, but at least uh, make it resistant to having this effect. But that's still being researched. I, you know, I can't share any specifics with you today. I just wanted to let you know about this as an issue and let you know it's being looked into. If I eventually get more information, I'll update and provide it here. So let's just do a quick recap. You need to assess your utilities lightning performance to date. You need to use your resources available to you to decide what you know what you want in your OPGW specifications, a lightning class level or specific design requirements, whatever. You should test to confirm that it's meeting your confirmant, uh, your uh, specifications, your requirements. Monitor what goes on in the field. Make sure that things are working the way you want them to. Uh, eventually, you're going to have damage, so prepare for it. So, thank you. So, if we can open um, mics, you're welcome to raise your hand and ask a question, or you can type it into the chat. But this is your time to. Wow, you're really being quiet. Okay, I see somebody raise their hand. So yeah. Go for it. Uh, go for do it. You, do, you, do you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Okay, okay, good. So, uh, with regards to the um, uh, the communication impact, uh, can we correlate the uh, uh, the uh, there was a gigabyte. Uh, that would be impactful. Can we correlate it to the energy that uh, the strike has? The amount of uh, Coulomb? Uh, I, I don't have data that would provide that correlation. OK. You know, in, I, in I was just one. In, in yeah, theory, I, 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 yeah, I, I understand your, your question, but I, I can't do that because I, I don't have the data. 
mm -hmm. don't even I don't know if the data exist. But um, what what you would need would be information about the duration and intensity, and maybe that Visala organization that I referred to earlier, maybe they have that such data. Um, one of the utilities that I know that has experienced this problem, they, from what I understand, they know it happens, but but they're not, they don't have the data either, right? So they're not saying, okay, we had a strike and we detected that it had you know, this intensity, this duration, therefore this number of coulombs in it. Uh, that would be helpful. I wish somebody would collect that data because th then you could get a correlation. Is it 50 coulombs? Is it 100 coulombs? Is it, you know, what is the threshold to cause problems? But uh, as of today, I, I, don't, I don't believe the data exists. In theory, it could be collected, but I don't think that's been done. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, I hope by doing things like this and pointing out these sort of gaps in our knowledge, I, I hope that it word gets to the right person who's got some money <laughs> that they can put on the table to say, yeah, we should collect that data. I, I, I wish that would happen. Um, let's see. Uh, thank you for the, the kind comments here. Uh, somebody asked, I said lightning was the second leading cause and they missed what was the number one cause. The number one cause was installation problems. So really you could think of it as, you know, an installation problem is something that should show up relatively quickly um, in, the, in the field. So you might could make a case that lightning is the number one long-term problem, but, but officially from from the data that I have and what's been reporting, uh, Lightning is number two. Hello, Michael. Aluminum Alley 6201 is used in cable for conductivity of heat and energy. In my opinion, we should work on the alloy increase heat resistance. Um, there are other alloys that are available, but I don't know that it would change things significantly. Um, the uh, fundamentally what's going on is, of course, the, the energy tries to find uh, the path of least resistance to ground. And so th when a lightning strike hits a cable, uh, the energy is then not going to be uh, evenly distributed as it flows through the cable. It's going to tend to go to the things with lower resistance. And that's always going to be aluminum alloy wires if they're present. And so I just don't know that it would be possible to come up with an alloy um, that that wouldn't still be the most vulnerable one. You know, the best you could hope for would be parity. Um, and I, I just don't know that that would really help much. I mean, in theory, yes, but I'm just not sure in reality if it would help much. Um, let's see, I have a question about getting the PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, um, the, uh, uh, that leads me to touch on this. If you want to get the credit, what's going to happen after, after we close out is you're going to get an email, a follow-up email. And thank you all for attending, by the way. And um, for attending, you'll get this follow-up email. There's three things in that follow-up email. Number one is there's a link to go take a test, and that's you need to pass the test with 70%, and then you get your continuing education credits. There's another link that's going to take you to where you can view this again. So there's a the, we've recorded it today, and you'll be able to view it again. And you know I I probably tomorrow night. Friday night, you can't find something you want to watch on Netflix. Well, you know, you can go watch this again, right? Great entertainment, fun for the whole family even. Um, impress your friends and family for that matter. The third thing is a link to a survey. So you can give us feedback and also like make suggestions. Um, th that would help. But at that second link, uh, in addition to the video recording, you can also get the slides. So that's it's on our website. So thanks for the question. 
why is the aluminum tube in aluminum alloy 1350 and not in 6201? The tube would contribute in mechanical resistance. I don't know that I fully understand the questions, um, but I'll take a stab at it. 1350 aluminum is not used in OPGW for the wires because it would always fail the fault current test. I, I saw a cable designer make that mistake once at a company I used to work for. He thought it would be great to get improve the fault current by using 1350 aluminum alloy wires. 1350 is not as strong as 6201. Uh, it's quite ductile. As you know, it's used on conductors. Um, in the fault current test, it immediately bird cages and really badly because the lower resistance at, coupled with the lower duct, the lower resistance meant it was taking a disproportionate share of the fault current. And then the the, the improved or the higher ductility meant that uh, the, the wire immediately expanded and then it was free to pop out. You know, the heat, the heat expansion, the wire needed to go somewhere. It couldn't contain itself, so it just popped out. So you, then you fail the test for that reason. Now, aluminum pipe and the aluminum pipe type cable, that's usually a, a thousand series alloy as well. But because it's a pipe in the center of the cable, it I'm sure you get some expansion, but it basically holds its shape and you don't fail the test. So that, that's my experience with those alloys. What are typical installation errors? Uh, the the there are a lot uh, of errors that you can make. Probably the the big ones are letting the tension go too high, right? Because um, especially if you're working with an anti-rotation device, anti-rotation device gets a little bit hung up going through a block. And what do the guys in the field do? You crank up the tension. Uh, Another reason for tension to go too high is that the pull was not properly designed. Um, everybody has pulling restrictions and there's a pulling limit. It's uh, typically 20% rated breaking strength. Well, you can do some math and you can see that in certain situations, you're going to exceed that 20% rated breaking strength because you're pulling too far or going through too many angles. Uh, and you increase the tension and you damage the cable. Uh, let's see, next installation error, tension too high. Uh, not using anti-rotation device when it's required is, is going to be a problem. There's one that's in the back of my mind and maybe it'll come out later. So let me try to come back to that. Uh, let's, I suggest in using elements as zirconium. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's not a bad idea, but, but that's back to this concept of you're trying to increase the heat performance of the wire. Does it really help? I, I'm not sure. I, I'd have to look into it more. Other questions? Anything else? Uh, I'm now I'm back to still percolating on the installation questions. Uh, so tension too high, you're twisting the cable. That would be you didn't use the anti-rotation device and you needed one. Too many angles. Oh, I know the one I wanted to tell you. Block size. Using blocks, stringing blocks that are too small. Uh, manufacturers have guidelines. And uh, then crews will go out and use like X100 blocks. And those are very small blocks. They're not good really for most OPGWs 95% of the time. There are a few exceptions where you can use them. Uh, very short pulls basically is what it boils down to. So um, a variation of having a stringing block too small is using something that's called banana blocks or uh, or ganging blocks. Um, 
in the installation presentation that I do, I talk about the effects of this. But basically, if a block is too small, it doesn't have enough uh, bearing surface. And lack of bearing surface coupled with the force on the cable can flatten the cable and then you get damage. Um, aluminum pipe type designs are in particular vulnerable to that uh, problem happening, which is why you're back to your block size is important and you have to do whatever the manufacturer tells you to do. So, okay, well, I appreciate everybody's time and attention today. We're a little bit over. Uh, I told you, look for the follow-up email. Please give us feedback. Please also make suggestions for other things you'd like to hear me talk about. Um, have a great day. Catch you next time. Bye-bye. And you're welcome for everybody who's telling me thank you. I, uh, I'm glad to be of service. <laughs>